so um this meeting is being recorded okay here we go again so um the point i wanted to make regarding tosca is that that decomposition the tosca decomposition could happen directly in fio there are open source parsers for tosca including one <laughs> that, that i wrote which is written in go and could be very easy to integrate into the current topology controller so to go back to steven's diagram we have that nf topology crd which is our input for the topology controller but there's nothing really blocking us from reading tosca directly right so if you have a higher level service orchestrator and it creates an nsd in tosca we could potentially take it directly into the topology controller it could read that c star directly and then do exactly the same thing it's doing right now but again instead of using a krm based approach which has the crd in uh, as an nf topology that it would be an NSD packaged as a CSAR that we would consume. So, so again, th there are a lot of questions here about which level it works and are we going through, are we doing decomposition in, in NEFIO or do we want to keep it at a higher level orchestrator? Um, I think post R1, if we start trying to get integrate NEFIO into existing flows of orchestrators, I think that will teach us a lot more about you know, what we should be doing. But again, this is the SIG, I think, where, where a lot of these requirements will have to be uh, generated. Tom? Thought? <laughs> we, uh, I'm not sure if Bonad came first or not me. I have some question for you. Sure. OK, so um, I would like to um, discuss a little bit sort of the scope of what we are trying to manage from a slightly different angle. You've now started with this process view and try to sort of derive out of this process flow the demarcation line between the responsibilities of nephew and the service orchestrator. <clears throat> My sort of sort of primitive thinking when I first saw the nephew's three column approach, infrastructure, cloud native network functions, and then the configuration and was asking myself, where would I sort of then differentiate sort of what the service orchestrator would be doing? I came up with an analogy of uh, sort of um, uh, software uh, packages, such as a database process. That means I can try to manage the host of the database. That would be the first column. I can try to think of sort of deploying the software, the, the, let's say a MySQL cluster onto that host. That would be the sec second qual column. And the third column would be related to the configuration of the MySQL service in such a manner that it, for instance, finds its uh, sort of uh, um, file systems where it can store its data, might also sort of um, set up logging, et cetera. But it wouldn't take care of establishing any kind of database schemas, adding users, and adding any kind of access credentials. That would be related to this, let's say, service orchestration part. That means from a sort of a primitive sort of understanding, basically Nephew could, for instance, focus on making sure that the software processes are installed correctly, running correctly, and then can be configured to account for any kind of service usage as needed by, via the SO. That means that would be sort of a sort of deliberate demarcation line when we're saying, that the software processes are up and running, they can reach to whatever kind of communication partners they need. And um, apart from that, they are not providing a service at that point in time. And then on top of that, you've got the whole life cycle and the life cycle management of the services, which have their own right of being sort of uh, managed in a sort of um, accounting for dependencies, et cetera. Just I, I think that's a great analogy. Yeah, I, I think that's great, right? Because it's exactly that. First, you want to deploy MySQL. And, and let's imagine a more complicated case where MySQL, uh, yes, you need to assign it storage, but you want really high performance storage. Maybe this is MySQL for you know, a, a very uh, heavy apl application. So you want maybe a network accelerator too to make sure that clients can connect to MySQL fast. So all of these are requirements that you want to set up. So Nephia would take care exactly of that making sure that your infrastructure requirements are specified and a Kubernetes cluster is stood up 
with those requirements, right? If it requires, say, some kernel driver, like we do right now for free 5GC UPF, it makes sure to stand it up. And then you have basically MySQL up, but it doesn't have any tables in it, right? So the next step, right, in this flow would be to actually configure <laughs> MySQL with the tables that you need for your particular application, right? Which in this case would be our network service, right? The network yes. service is the application. Yes. Um, I, I think what we really, what could help us moving forward is this step here that's called configure. Now, configuration is an extremely big word in telco, right? It, it, is the, it, is, it is our main meat, right? Provisioning and standing things up is relatively trivial to, to the actual act of configuration. But the problem is that configuration bleeds into everything. We call everything configuration. And Nephia, exactly. we has this concept of configuration as data. Right, and um, which we, we're doing everything with KRM declaratively. And some of those aspects are configurations, right? Network attachments, for example. Um, but then there's configuration that also happens after that. So I think what could help us move forward is to take this configure step and really break it down. And I think that could add clarity into which, which aspects of configuration are part of NEFIO and are in its scope and which are not, which, which are things that are really belong to a different level of orchestration. Um, yeah, I, this, this has not been something that's been done, I think, in telco quite yet, right? Because configuration, I think, is taken almost for granted. Mm. But we need to start decomposing configuration, if you will, right? And maybe even finding better terminology for it, right? Because configuration can cover netconf. <laughs> It can co cover uh, configuring Linux kernels for, uh, <laughs> for deployment, configuring BIOS for the machine racks before you actually install <laughs> the operating systems on the nodes. There are so many aspects to this configuration, but we, we need absolute clarity on what goes where. Um, that is my thinking. But, but yeah, I think that's a great analogy of, of the database, right? May I ask a question? Sure, sure. This is an open discussion, right? So it's not. A, okay. <laughs> I, I don't so, have all the answers. Yeah. So uh, talking about uh, this uh, decomposition of service, let's say you starting from NSD. So typically the service orchestration, the you know Tosca, whatever the 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 format coming in, they uh, look at initially end to end service orchestration. They some service contain multiple service network services. For each services, they decompose further to find out which is underlying the uh, network function and their uh, network connection and you know, also cluster affinity, all kind of uh, information in there. So once that's why usually uh, the NFO or NFO in Oren, they handle all decomposition. And then so they know what to uh, connect each other and they know where to uh, where like they to, to deploy which cluster deploy. So those decomposition have enough information. So that's why you are, I agree that the network uh, topology controller, I think to me, this to me for R1, I see me this is to me as a use as a simulator to me. Service orchestra okay, so simulator kind of, so to make it uh, trigger the uh, nephew, but reality, right, real scenario, that is the proper NFO, they decompose, they find out network function. Then using some, some interface, they interface with nephew, can you deploy this network function? Like for example, AMF, UPF, and SMF. They, each one, they, you know, using the, uh, they cycle and they, they call nephew one by one. And then once they get it, they know, you know, they also tell where, which cluster they're gonna deploy. And then also they know how to connect each other. So they have all the information. So so that's why I'm not clear network topology control in here uh, in this picture. So that's why I tried to ask you what's your view here. So you already mentioned about network topology control could be optional in this picture. And I don't know what's the uh, foreseeing uh, your uh, vision here. Uh, how to trigger a nephew. Right, and, and you, you, you kind of uh, uh, put, I, I very specifically did not want to take a slide from Etsy. Etsy has their own version of this, <laughs> yeah, which yeah. has levels of orchestrators, right? There's service, right. there's SO, and beyond it, the, there is the NF, NFO, right? So right, there's, right. Um, 
there's there's two levels and a kind of two levels of decomposition done done as well. So I was very careful not to try to do that because that complicates it a little bit more. Here we have service orchestration kind of going directly into the network functions, right? Um, mm -hmm. we, we we have an opportunity, I think, in FU to to rethink some of these relationships of orchestration. I don't know exactly where NF topology would fit in. As I said, there, there are two options. So for us, for an FEOR1, NF topology is very useful for setting up our use case all at once, right? Because we can create a single CRD that will deploy everything. So, so yes, mm -hmm. as you said, it functions as our SO. But the idea, of course, is nobody is going to create those uh, NF topology instances manually necessarily as a way to deploy, right? There is probably a higher level orchestrator that, that will do it for you. So we'll generate maybe those NF topology CRs or the higher level orchestrator would work more directly with, with Nafio primitives. So, so again, I think we, ha we have two options here. And if, if we do want to take NF topology and make it more useful for higher level service orchestrators, you know, it could evolve in R2 into something a little bit different. But we don't know exactly what the requirements are. You know, we need a real use case with a real orchestrator <laughs> that is actually being used, and and see if what ways an FEO can fit into the current flow. And and you know, this is just an example in ONAP. Again, it's not even exactly how ONAP works, but it's it's a little bit similar, right? Most orchestrators that I'm familiar with have a certain workflow. They have this idea of create, provision, configure, activate host configure, right? Every orchestrator has its own model for its workflow, right? So um, yeah, we, we, there, there's a lot of thinking we need to do moving forward, right? And this is just an opening shot to that conversation. Um, and, and there are aspects too, you know, we talked a little bit about Etsy and its structure. And if we want to support Etsy style NSDs, right? Using the Etsy Tosca mm -hmm. uh, models, so, so there's already a strong opinion in there how to define network services, right? Do we want to plug into that directly? We could, we have the option. Technologically, we absolutely can. There are pros and cons. We can do that and we can do more. We, we, we can actually support multiple ways of, of connecting FEO to higher level orchestrators, right? Yeah, the uh, talk, I think that there's a discussion at the NEFU uh, the uh, event last time uh, talking about, uh, you know, one person said uh, talking to SC Soldier 5 coming into NFO, that's fine. But South Spons 2 of the NFO talking to Nephew, uh, we cannot use Soul 3, right? So that means that we need to define the scope or granularity of the connection point to Nephew and then also mechanism. We're not using the, uh, the push-based uh, command line like Soul 3. We need to, uh, you know, following the pool model, which nephew uh, supporting CRD and CR and then the triggering point and also CD mechanism. So I'm, I'm very curious about this interface between uh, the first blue box and then second down uh, blue box of which represent nephew in this case. So um, uh, so we need to study on that and who's gonna uh, the, decompose the services and how you're gonna connect that to nephew and nephew NTO, NTC bump up into a uh, service level, then they handle all the, uh, the interface up with the upper layer and then talking the nephew, uh, different mechanism like a CID, CR. Uh, so we need to discuss, okay, that's it. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, I, and you know, one, one of our biggest challenges is that the previous models that we had from Etsy and, and SOL3 and really the whole Tosca design is comes from the VNF world. <laughs> and in the VNF world, we, we had a very clear workflow where first you had to provision the resources, the virtual machines, and then you start configuring them. But Kubernetes flips everything on its head, right? Because Kubernetes is not a VIM, right? So, so the infrastructure and the workloads are deployed together and they're deployed declaratively. So we're kind of combining phases together and we're making our, our life easier in many ways because Kubernetes is so much more capable and, and at least in terms of orchestration than OpenStack was or, or the, 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 what I will call uh, the legacy <laughs> uh, cloud mm -hmm. platforms that we have. So 
we're, we're able to combine some of these phases together, right? The, the declarative approach allows us to kind of break away from that chicken and egg problem of having to provision and then having to instantiate where we can instantiate and provision all at once. But it's also a challenge for a higher level design and our interaction for a higher level design because we, we didn't think of, of provisioning that way. So <laughs> yeah, th th this is going to be a challenge for us. And, and I think it would be really best if we have real POCs with real orchestrators trying to connect to Nephew. So I think after Nephew R1, we will actually have a set of components that could be used. And we, I think as a community have to start integrating. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I think another thing we need to do is to reach out to many of these uh, orchestrator companies because they haven't been involved in uh, Nephew very much so far. And um, maybe that will be easier post R1. I think the, from me, that's the beauty of the nephew. Uh, instead of the orchestrating you know, each one, they do uh, the decorative and using full model choreography way. So that's why the instant service, create service instant configuration, they can handle uh, decorative. So each component, each controller, they can pull the event from the, uh, the source of truth and they can handle interactively. That's why uh, to me, the operator doesn't have to uh, the orchestrate every single detail one by one, assign service, create service, configure service, activate. So I think that we have to different way and nephew way, but uh, we have to think about a little differently. Uh, right, and you know we're we're careful always not to boil the ocean, right? We're <laughs> we don't want to revolutionize things so much that it can't integrate <laughs> into the existing universe. So, so I think I think that's what we have to think of really moving forward. And for example, you know the whole issue of supporting Helm, right? We we also don't want to create a system that can, can, can't interact with existing packages, right? So, so, so I think we might need. To, we might end up having multiple integration points, right? So there would be a way you could use NF topology controller to do a lot of that heavy lifting for you. And that means we might have to uh, beef it up, <laughs> its capabilities moving forward in R2. Or we need to clarify how you, in you interact actually with the lower level primitives in FU. Mm -hmm. um, configuration as, as data is a very, very powerful approach. But the devil's in the details, as I like to say, you know, who, who is in charge of which parts of the data? Some of them are inputs into Nephew, but some of them are outputs from Nephew, right? Because once Nephew finishes and everything is stood up and running, you know, to use, uh, uh, to use Bernard's uh, uh, metaphor, you know, the database is up right now. Now you have to create its schemas. And that happens from a different level that is not part of, of Nephew's. Uh, scope, right? Nephew is in charge of bringing up those network functions uh, correctly. But what happens next is that they have to integrate into the network as a whole. Um, so we have to make sure that our outputs are clear too, right? The data that comes out from us, you know, the, this is part of the Google seed component that we have, the, the status aggregator, make sure that the status comes in in a way that could be read from a higher level orchestrator and be used to, to start making those uh, uh, service connections, right? the activation. Um, hey, Tal, so I had, uh, I had another thing. So the example that Bernard, you gave MySQL, I think in a simplistic single instance context, it makes a lot of sense, right? Uh, and I'm aligned with you, but I think the complexity comes in terms of business logic split brain. When you do things at scale, right? If you want to, let's say, bring up SQL servers for serving certain capacity in a cross region with certain replication parameters and placement logic and so forth, right? How do you demarcate in that point what would fit in the lower domain orchestrator versus in the upper domain, right? That's, that's, uh, for, me still, that's still for me infrastructure. Replication and sort of deployment in a distributed setup is still infrastructure. Whereas sort of, again, the content and who's allowed to access the content and possibly any kind of business logic, which you might want to also co-locate with, uh, with the database would be related to the service. So again, it's more about if we're saying that the network or the, the functions which we are deploying 
are up and running and can be configured to account for services. That would be my demarcation point and the handover to the service orchestrator. That means sort of, I wouldn't want to go into the nitty gritty of trying to explain to a high level orchestrator what kind of replication sort of parameters they have to configure in order to sort of do an upgrade when sort of upgrading the database um, sort of um, um, software package. So this is something which is going to kill any kind of uh, sort of designer because then he would have to go into the nitty gritty. So I would like to have a demarcation point where we say the software process as such without the service configuration is sort of the demarcation point for the nephew domain. And on top of that, then the actual service configuration can happen. Yeah, Bernard, that makes a lot of sense. Again, I didn't mean to necessarily having to enumerate, but my request to especially the telcos and SIG1 is to come up with these key day zero, one, two real world scenarios. And in that contextually explain the demarcation between SO and what nephew would be, right? Unless yeah. we go to that level of detail, it's hard for people to always conceive in terms of the right demarcation points. Yeah, so my, my thoughts here simply would be actually to sort of have an interaction also with Ericsson, Nokia, Marvini, et cetera, and talk about them, uh, tell them sort of, would it be possible to try to establish over the time this split? Yeah, and could you come up with sort of criteria and guidance regarding the network functions you, which you are actually programming to say, can we somehow sort of make sure that sort of what we're doing in this initial configuration via nephew is clearly separated from what we're doing related to the service configuration. And to be honest, if I'm looking at sort of real world examples, I see for instance, that a lot of configuration sort of um, for the services happening via netconf and the basic configuration is happening by the typical Helm charts, et cetera, which are being used for, to deploy a solution. There is already this notion of, yes, we have to sort of account for these two different types of life cycles and changes. And we could try to come up with a this sort of a, a working group trying to establish this demarcation line. Yeah, perfect. I just wanted to again park it with especially the telcos in SIG1. And yes, we should pull in, of course, the NF vendors in terms of ensuring whatever we end up planning as the demarcation points is realistic vis a vis what the current realities are. Yes. Yeah, and, and what I'm hoping for is to be able to reach out to some of these uh, orchestration vendors <laughs> and have them involved as well. Um, you know, we have own app that's open source and we can use that uh, as an example. Um, uh, we have EMCO, right, a, a smaller project. And let's not forget our, our, uh, our work with ORAN, right, which is more at the infrastructure level, at the O2 IMS level. But it ties into this discussion too, right? Because this is exactly about infrastructure, right? The big challenge here is infrastructure. <laughs> that is by far the biggest one, right? The, the workloads themselves are more straightforward, but it's making sure that that chicken and egg dance between, okay, the, the, the network function has the requirements for the Linux kernel. So we can specify those requirements declaratively, but who is actually going to provision that Linux kernel and install it, right? So there's the platform vendor, but then all of this has to tie into an orchestration narrative that's very clear. You know, who is in charge of what? Um, and there are different narratives from different vendors. Uh, Google does things differently from Red Hat, right? And we want to make sure that all those narr narratives can be there. So, you know, with Nephew R1, we were very careful to break things down into primitive building blocks, right? But we don't always know who is actually going to provide that CR, who is going to specify it. By who, I mean what, right? Because this is all about automation. So there is a higher level orchestrator that will be generating these inputs for Nephew. But we don't have that integration quite yet, right? So, so I, I really think we need to start building these POCs, showing how it is possible and exploring the different kinds of narratives that are there and have just very clear stories about it, right? Because until now, honestly, it's been, we, we've been waving our hands a little bit around it. Uh, we're saying here, here are all these primitives, uh, you assemble them into a whole. 
but but we need those stories clear, in my opinion. Agree, agree. Dal, um, I think um, I had a couple of questions okay around this. So I was looking at this uh, NF topology. Uh, uh, before I think I would go ahead. I think probably uh, this is Gish, um, um, I'm from Infosys and just trying to I think um, trying to get into nephew and understand right uh, how things are working out here and probably we can also contribute in some way if possible. Uh, so I think um, uh, as, as, as I can see, NF topology is pretty much, uh, I think, aligned to what is NSD is. I think probably somebody also has indicated the same thing, right? I think on the way, I think NSD has all your BNFs and uh, connection points and right uh, uh, virtual links and all. I think you're kind of emulating the same aspects. In, and I, I, I believe for translating from NSD to NF topology, some possible, I think, approach we can go with, right, uh, as a possible integration approach. Uh, but uh, I think uh, Beyong also mentioned that we probably would not be then touching anywhere in the VNF aspect side um, uh, to be kind of working at the NS level in service orchestrator, right? Just passing on the mm -hmm. NST, converting into NF topology, and then kind of pushing it to nephew and nephew to the rest of the things, right? Uh, and that would take your probably lifecycle management aspect of right uh, the NS. Uh, are, are you also looking at probably the uh, 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 the package management aspect of it, right? Um, especially the VNF and all, uh, any kind of integration we are planning there? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, th this is the question. We, we can have the, the, the nephew topology controller consume CSARS directly. There doesn't hmm. have to be a higher level translation. So we, we can really ease the work of higher level orchestrators and they can talk to nephew directly in the language that they already know if it's Tosca. Um, so, so that's possible, but you know, th there are a lot of details, as you pointed out, it's the vendor specific configuration. So Tosca is an object oriented language. So part of mm -hmm. the way the NSDs are used, yes, there are base types provided by Etsy SOLs, <laughs> but mm -hmm. then vendors could extend those types, inherit them and add properties that are specific to them. So, so if you have a CSAR for a specific topology, it's not generic, right? It would have mm -hmm types mm -hmm. for say Nokia, Samsung, Huawei, et cetera. <laughs> and, um, you know, we can do this right now already in, in FUR1. Mm -hmm. As we said, we have just this gen general UPF and mm -hmm. we match it to a free 5GC UPF, right? But we could mm -hmm. provide configurations that are very specific for specific vendors. Um, yeah. So in the, in the Kubernetes world, it's a little bit different. You don't inherit a type. You simply create a new, a new type, <laughs> a CR, and you can associate them together, right? So we've been slowly evolving a meta model in FEO as kind of a way to associate, if you will, a general abstract type with more specific types that are vendors, specific to specific vendors. Um, so really, I, I think you're right. You know, what we're doing is compatible in many ways with what's happening in Tosca. Mm -hmm. um, and to the point, Tosca is declarative, right? Tosca and Kubernetes were basically released at about the same year. <laughs> and, yeah. and they uh, took very similar approaches, right? A declarative approach to orchestration. Um, and you know, we, we even have a history of that with OpenStack Heat, which was even earlier, right? So I think we learned mm -hmm. a lot that declarative orchestration is the way to go, uh, but the devil is in the details, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, who's declaring? That, that's the, the issue that is important to me. Who is actually creating those declarations? Because some of that are, are manual. There is a solution architect designing a topology for a specific customer, a particular network service. But then a lot of it is generated automatically too. And um, we, we need to sort this out, at least from Nefio's perspective. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Ta, who's decreating the uh, model and then who's the packaging the CRD and then who's and the packaging going into the uh, Nephew uh, catalog and then distribute and hydration. And then we don't want to destroy the Nephew uh, this architecture to interface with the upper bound. Upper bound has to honor what nephew handling the creative way and package management hydration and all the automated uh, based on Kubernetes you know, architecture. So yeah, yeah, good, good item to think about. Yeah, we, the narrative right now is a little bit complex. We, we have two different maybe avenues for getting 
input data. In Tenefio, there is injection of data, but there's also specialization of data automatically. Um, so, which is part of the power, but with this power comes, a, 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 again, trying to understand how this will interact with other systems is something we have to continue discussing. Um, Ms. Kaushik, I think you've had your hand up for a while, but please jump in. Hey, that was a stale hand from the previous discussion oh, that okay. I had. But, uh, I also oh, realized yeah. we are at time, so yes. we should wrap it up. Yes, I, I will say I'm uh, working on a blog that will be published uh, as part of our uh, uh, public relations spree after R1, which I, I actually discuss some aspects of this and I'm still working on it. So this discussion is actually helping me think through some of the points I wanna make, but, but really thinking about the next step of Nephio would be exactly that. How do we make Nephio actually work with, within existing telco flows? Um, all right, <laughs> I can keep talking for hours, but I won't. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Stephen and Tal, for the for the discussion. And I think I have taken some of the action items for Sigmund to both define the network architecture, define the specific scenarios, roles and responsibilities between SO and Nephew and so forth. Uh, this will be part of the subgroups that I described earlier. For each of the subgroups, we'll create clear uh, ownership, deliverables, and how that feeds into the, the main group and so forth. So please expect something by end of this week on what the subgroups uh, focus areas and the structure would be. And then we'll request people to vote for who would want to be leading each of those subgroups. Of course, we'll need time commitment and so forth, but we'll work with you to you know realize that outcome. And with that, we should, is there, was there anything else logistically that anyone else wanted to bring up? Okay, well, thank you everyone for the great discussion today. Have a good rest of the week. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, thank you. 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 bye-bye.